I had a little poem I wrote, something like this. It said, uh, now I just think I was only about 12 years old. And standing up there today looking up that canyon and thinking that lion will be sitting right here in this den room looking out the window in a glass window. I was thinking of a little poem. I went back and picked it up. Something like this. Just think how God, do you believe God's in all inspiration? God has to write a song. You believe God's in songs? Jesus said so. He referred back to David. Don't you know what David said in the Psalms? You know, has not look at the very crucifixion. David sang it in the twenty-second Psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All my bones they stare at me. They pierce my hands and my feet. You know, and that was a song. Psalms is a, is a song. And in this poetry, just watch how it come to pass. Sitting there, a little old kid with a barred sheet of paper. I said, "I am lonesome, oh so lonesome, far that far away southwest." Where the shadows fall the deepest over the mountain crest, I can see a lurking coyote all around the purple haze. I can hear a lobo hollering down where the longhorns graze. And somewhere up a canyon, I can hear a lion whine in that far-off Catalina Mountains at the Arizona line. Forty years later, I'm sitting right there at that canyon, that lion looking me in the face. Oh God, there's a land beyond the river somewhere, friends. It just—it's got to be there. See, there's, there's too much speaking of it. Have you seen it around the world? You don't go to sleep, stand on a platform talking to people. You hear me go into visions and come back when I'm riding in a car with you anywhere else and tell you things that's going to happen and never fails. Never have. Has anybody ever seen it fail? No. It can't fail. It won't fail as long as it's God. Notice, right on the platform, thousands before, tens of thousands of people. Even in other languages that I can't even speak, still it don't fail. See? God. Now, in this vision, or as I was speaking, I looked and I saw a strange thing. Now, it seemed like that my little son Joseph was by my side. I was talking to him. Now, if you watch the vision real close, you'll see why Joseph was standing there. And I looked, and there was a big bush. And on this bush, in a, in a constellation of birds, little bitty birds, about a half inch long and a half inch high. They were little veterans. Their little feathers was beat down. And there was a, about two or three on the top limb, uh, six or eight on the next limb, and 15 or 20 on the next limb coming down in the shape of a pyramid. And those little fellows, little messengers, and they were pretty well worn out. And they were watching eastward, and I was at Tucson, Arizona, in the vision. For it made it so purpose that he didn't want me to fail to see where it was at. I was picking a sand burr off of me from the desert. And I said, now, I know this is a vision, and I know that I'm at Tucson. And I know that them little birds there represent something. And they were watching eastward. And all of a sudden, they take taken an ocean to fly. And away they went eastward. And as soon as they left, a constellation of larger birds came. They looked like doves, sharp pointed wings, kind of a gray color little lighter color than what these first little messengers was. And they were coming eastward swiftly. And no sooner than they got out of my sight, I turned again to look westward. And there it happened. There was a blast that actually shook the whole earth. I don't miss this. And you on tape, be sure you get this right. First, a blast. And I thought it sounded like a sound barrier. What you call it when planes cross the sound and the sound comes back to the earth. Just shook like roared everything. Then it could have been a, a, a great clap of thunder, lightning, 
I didn't see the lightning. I just heard that great blast that went forth that sounded like it was south from me, towards Mexico. But it shook the earth. And when it did, I was still looking westward and way off into eternity. I saw a constellation of something coming. It looked like that it might have been little dots. There could have been no less than five and not more than seven. But they were in the shape of a pyramid. Like these messengers coming. And when it did, the power of Almighty God lifted me up to meet Him. And I can see it. It's never left me. Eight days is gone. And I can't forget it yet. I never had anything to bother me like that has. My family will tell you. I could see those angels, those shaped back wings, traveling faster than sound could travel. They come from eternity in a split like a twinkling of an eye. Not enough to bat your eye, just a twinkle. They were there. I didn't have time to count. I didn't have time or than just look. Mighty ones, great powerful angels, snow white, wings set in heads, and they were... And when it did, I was caught up into this pyramid of constellations. This is the spot where Brother Brandon received the sword in his hand. Brother uh, Green and, and, a, and a couple of other brothers came to find it. And when they got to this spot, they, they just didn't know what to do, and so they decided to pray. And uh, Brother Green says that while he was praying, he had his hands out like this, and he felt the hand, his right hand begin to get warm, realizing that the sun was hitting his hand, and right through the, the horn there of the saddle, or the eye of the needle, the light came shining through, and he struck his hand, and he remembered that Brother Branham said that the, the sword was glistening in the sun. And at the time of the year uh, when Brother Brandon was here, uh, the, the rest of the canyon is in shadowed um, with darkness because of the winter season. And this spot right here is the only spot that receives light in the early hour, uh, morning hours. I went west wondering what was going to happen. One day I got a call from the Lord. I told my wife, I said, honey, I'm probably, my work is over. I didn't know. I said, God's probably finished with me now, and I'll be going home. You go get with Billy. Take the children. God will make a way for you somehow. Go on, live true to God. See if the children get through school. Raise them in the admonition of God. She said, Bill, you don't, you don't know that's true. I said, no, but a man couldn't survive that. One morning, the Lord woke me up and said, Get up there, Sabine, and tell them. I took a piece of paper. And my Bible, the wife said, where are you going? I said, I don't know. I'll tell you when I come back. I went up in the canyon, climbed, plumb up where the eagles was flying around. I was watching some deer standing there. And I knelt down to pray and raised up my hands, and a sword struck my hand. I looked around, I thought, what's that? I'm not beside myself. Here's that sword in my hand, bright, shiny, glistening in the sun. I said, now there's not people in miles of me way up here in this canyon. Where could that come from? I heard a voice said, That's the king's sword. Amen. I said, A king knights a man with a sword. He, the voice come back said, Not a king's sword, but the king's sword. Amen. The word of the Lord. I said, Fear not. It's only the third pull. It's the vindication of your ministry. You remember on the tape, church, what time it is? I've quoted over. Remember. Something's fixing to take place major. Now I made the whole nation testify to it. Every yeah, newspaper on the Associated Press and one of our leading magazines and everything else testified to it all over yet. Well, what a privileged people. A, a privileged people is Christian to know that in this dark hour when there's no hope According to science, is an atomic bomb waiting for us. And no hope in our organizations ever getting together, they're consolidating with the mark of the beast. And when all of our hopes that way is gone, in our economy of our Christian 
fellowship amongst the organizations that's hiding up into Catholicism, which will be a mark of the beast in the Confederation Church. But in those who love God and are looking for reality, that the very God who made the promise in the Bible spreads it before our faith and makes the church and the people in science and magazines uh, and everything recognize that he's still God and can tell the What a time. Then in Sabinia Canyon that morning, praying and wondering what would happen, holding my hands out to God up on top of that mountain, that sword dropped into my hand with a pearl handle and this guard over it and a long blade about three foot long and glistening like hot metal or like chrome, razor sharp. And I didn't know what it was. And I said, I'm afraid of these things. And just then a voice spoke that shook the canyon. That this is the sword of the Lord. And the sword of the Lord is the word of the Lord. Amen. For the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Amen. I believe they told me Brother Hickerson just took this out of the magazine. He put it on my desk back there. That is that constellation of angels that's in the magazine that was uh, spoke of. See the pyramid shape? Look at this one on this side, the pointed wing coming with his chest out like that on my right-hand side as I spoke from this same pulpit months and months and months ago. See? There it is. And Look mag or Life magazine has it, the, uh, uh, the May issue, May the 17th, I believe it is. Is that right? May the 17th issue. Mrs. Woods was telling me today that many called her and asked, that's in the May issue, May the 17th. It's a mysterious cloud. The cloud is 26 miles high and 30 miles across. And that's what we were speaking of here. And that's where the angel of the Lord came down and shook the place. And the whole it sound louder. I know there's one man. If I think Brother Southman, I seen him a while ago somewhere. He's here. He was standing. Yeah, right back here. He was standing near when it happened. I guess I wasn't too far from him. I just seen him, tried to wave to him, only I had his binoculars, that the the uh, animals in which we were hunting had wasn't on this hill, not went on the other hill. I found them the day before and told them where to go to. And I went over here where if they come this way, I'll just shoot up in the air and run them back that way so that they could get their 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 animal. So Havelina is what it was. And so... I went over on this side, and it wasn't, there wasn't on either side. I seen Brother Fred walk out, and it wasn't there. He went back, and Brother Norman went over the hill, and I turned, went down in a little chasm, and come up just by myself about a mile and a half through some real rugged country. And I was sat down and was just looking around. He's getting up in the day, and I was picking those, what we call their goat headers. It's something like a burr. Picking them off of my trouser leg. Just exactly the same kind that I saw myself doing when I was here telling you about the vision six months about before it happened. And I said, that's strange. And look how perfect north I am of Tucson. Kind of northeast makes Tucson. You remember I said a little southwest. And I said, that's strange. And I looked at, at the burr like this, picked them off of my, many of them, off of my uh, trouser legs. If you've never been there, that's a desert country. It isn't like this at all. About 20 times brighter there's no trees and things like there is here. It's just cactus and sand. So uh, I just looked at it like that. I just raised my eyes up at about, I'd say, a half a mile from me. I saw a whole head of, a herd of javelina laying, coming out on the end where there's eating some fillery. And I thought, now, if I can just get Brother Fred and Brother Norman to there, that's just the place. And the evening before, the Holy Spirit was so tremendous in the camp that he was telling me things that had happened and had taken place. I had to get up and walk away from the camp. And then uh, that next morning, I went up there. And I started, I said, now, if I can get to Brother Fred, I'll get him around this mountain, which is about a, a mile this way. I had to go about a, about two miles or better to pick him up, maybe three. Back this way down this, uh, what we call hogback. Come up like this, up top of these rugged, jagged mountains and run down this way. Cut across and come over and go down in this direction and pick him up. And then you have to go plump the bottom of the hill to get Brother Norman, which would probably have been about four or five miles. Then get back 
And I was going to put a, a little piece of Kleenex. At the, I was going to hang on a piece of, of the mesquite there so I could point myself to which ridge to go out when I come back. And I just come up over a little ridge where there's a lot of jagged rock. And there's a, a deer trail come down the other side about all 40, 50 yards beneath the cliff. It's about, oh, it's up in the day, I say, 8 o'clock or 9. Would you think something like that, Brother Fred? Maybe 9 o'clock, something. I run over on this side quickly to keep the javelinas from seeing me. They're a wild boar, you know, and they're pretty scary. So I, I went over the hill this way and cut, started running up the hill and just run along in a little, what we call a dog trot. And all of a sudden, the whole country just rung out. I never heard such a terrific blast. Just shuck and the rocks rolled. And I felt like I, I must have jumped five feet off the ground. It looked like it just, just scared me. I thought, oh my. I thought I'd gotten shot that somebody I had on a black hat. I thought they might have thought it was a javelina running up the mountain. Somebody had shot me. It went so loud right on me like that. Then all at once something said, look up. There it was. Then he told me, he said, open any of those seven seals, turn home. So here I come. I met Brother Fred and Brother Norman about an hour later when I found them. They were excited and talking about it. And there it is. And yeah, science man. says that it's impossible for, for any kind of a, a mist or anything to get that high, fog, vapor. See, it'll only go just, I wouldn't know I, I, we, when we go overseas, we travel 9,000 feet. That's above the storms. That's approximately about four miles. And say, let's say, maybe it's 15 miles until you can't get any more vapor. But this is 26 miles. And you hung there all day. They don't know what it is. But thank the Lord. Amen. We do. <laughs> thank you, Brother Hickerson. Um, uh, keep it on my desk. And all of the, the, the majority of the shopping was downtown. Uh, they had hotels, restaurants, you know, all of the major shopping was located in the downtown area of Tucson. Uh, and it was really the main hub for, for just about everything. There were beginning at that time to build restaurants, you know, out towards the east side of town. Uh, there were, you know, obviously grocery stores and things like that. But the majority of the, you know, the shopping for clothing and things like that were were uh, predominantly downtown. And one of the main stores downtown was the Penny Store. And I remember the Penny Store in particular as a, as a young boy because it had an escalator. And I remember playing on the escalator, going up and down and up and down. And my mother, you know, saying, you know, don't play on the escalator because I didn't just go down the up, I went up the down and down the, you know, and, and played on it. And so I, it was just kind of made an impression because I would be playing on it while she was doing her shopping. And as I got older, I remember going there and, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, shopping for clothing for school and remembered that they had these white t-shirts that we used to like as I was growing up and getting older. Uh, downstairs on the escalator, we'd go down and to the right, they had these tables that had the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, men's t-shirts, the white t-shirts. And so I vividly remember that, you know, those, that escalator and going up and down it, and even as I was older, I always remember there was one of the few places in all of Tucson that had, had an escalator at that time. And when they started building the malls, you know, around town, then, of course, some of the stores moved from the downtown area and moved into those mall areas, and then they started closing the downtown ones. And currently, I believe that they've torn it all down, that area where the Penny store was, and they've replaced it with the, you know, the uh, downtown library, and, and there's a, a, a little park down there. Now, I never noticed it too much until about four weeks ago. The wife never thought of it in this terms. About four weeks ago, the wife and I went down to Tucson to do some shopping. And while we were sitting, the wife, we went in downstairs and... And there was a bunch of sissy-like boys, had their hair red, you know, like the women does, and, and bangs combed down here in front, and these real high trousers on, kind of, I guess the beat necks or what you call them. And they were in there, and everybody's looking at them, and their heads is that big like the women that wears these here, a water head haircut, you know. And they were down there, and a young woman come by, and she said, what do you think about that? I said, then you ought to be ashamed of yourself, if you can think that. I said, he has just as much right to do it as you do. 
Neither one of you have a right. So I went upstairs and I sat down. And when I did, there's an escalator. It was a J.C. Penney store. And the escalator bringing the people up. Well, I really turned sick at my stomach of seeing those women come up there, young, old, and indifferent, wrinkled, young, and every way, with little bitty shorts on, their filthy body, and those sexy, dressed women with those great big heads uh, like that. And here they come, and one coming around that escalator is coming right up like that where I was sitting back in a chair, sitting there with my head down, and I turned and looked, and one of them coming up the steps was standing Spanish-speaking to another woman. She was a white woman speaking to the Spanish woman. And when I looked, all of the once I was changed. There I'd seen that before. Her eyes, you know how the women are doing now, painting their eyes just recently like cat. You know, put it up like this. And wearing cat glasses and everything, you know, with eyes up like this. And that green stuff there, their eyes, there was that thing that I seen when I was a child. There was the woman, just exactly. And I just got numb all over and began to look around. And there was those people mumbling, you know, going on about the prices and things. In the building, it looked like it. I just changed for a moment. And I looked and I thought, that's what I saw in hell. There they was, that canker. I thought because they were in hell, what made them that way, that greenish blue uh, under their eyes. And here was these women painted with greenish blue. Just the way that vision said about 40 years ago. Okay. Uh, about 40 years ago is what it's been. I'm 54. I was 14. So about 40 years ago, I, and that's the, the, that's the number anyhow of the judgment. Now, there was, I've seen that, and I couldn't even speak to my wife when she comes. She's over there trying to get a Sarah and the kids some kind of a, a dress or something for school. And I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even speak to her. And she said, what's the matter? Are you sick? I said, no. Something's just happened. Now, she don't know. She's waiting for this tape to return. I've never said it to nobody. And I thought I'd wait, as I promised, bring it to the church first. Okay? Bring it to the church. And that's my promise. And you'll realize after tonight, reason I try to keep my promise. And I thought then, as I noticed them tankered looking eyes on them women. There were the Spanish, the French, and Indian and white and all together, but that great big heads, you know, bushed up with that combs where they comb it back, way big, and then comes out, you know, you know how they do it, fix it in the, uh, like they do it, and then them canker looking eyes and the eyes with a paint that run back like a cat's eye. And then I'm talking, and there I was again, standing there in J.C. Penney's store, back in hell again. I, I got so scared, I thought, Lord, surely I haven't died, and you've let me come to this place after all. And there they were, making this ground like that, uh, in that vision, like you could just barely hear it with your ears, you know, just the mumbling going on people, and then women coming up that escalator and walking around there, and they're, ooh, ooh. there's them green, funny-looking eyes, mournful. Wife come up, and I said, just let me alone with me. I said, if you don't mind, I, I want to go home. And she said, are you sick? I said, no. Just go ahead, honey, if you got any shopping to do. She said, no, I'm finished. And I said, let me take you by the hall. See? I walked up. She said, what's the matter? I said, matey, I, 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 something happened up there. And while I was under that, I thought this. What day are we living in? Could this be the third pool? I saw him get up from this table and he went over and, and, and we had a shovel leaning up against a tree. So he picked up this shovel and he walked over to that rock and he was 
shoveling dirt kind of to put the coals out, you know. And all of a sudden, we heard this earth, this uh, whirlwind, and it was coming straight down out of the sky, and it was just screaming very loud, very loud. You could tell it wasn't anything natural. It was supernatural, but we didn't know what it was. We didn't know why or anything. And so I looked at Brother Branham, I was watching him, and he goes and he, he just looks up at it, pulls his hat off, and he stands there and looks right up in that. It came down about 10 feet off of the ground right on the top of the little mesquite trees. And, and it was whipping those trees, just whipping them and whipping them, pulling rocks out of the cliff and, and throwing them all over the place. And he stood there, and we, every eye was glued on him. And it all of a sudden went away. It went right straight back up like it came and went out of hearing. And he he kind of acted as if he didn't know whether to talk about that or not. And uh, so as he walked back over to where we were standing, he said, you know, one time God spoke to Job in a whirlwind. And that's all he said. Then later on that afternoon, then he began to talk about it being judgment striking the West Coast and so forth. Now notice, he went in by the plan of God, foreknowledge, call of God, and the Word of God, and went in before the drought set in. Now, we know that judgment is ready to strike. Standing on the hill that day, Brother Bankswood standing here was walking up the hill. Maybe I quote it again. So that build your faith for this prayer line is fixing to take place in the next 10, 15 minutes. I was just walking ahead of Brother Banks. He was, I uh, think he had left Sister Ruby when she was sick. And he, coming behind me, I noticed his face red. I looked back. I thought the hill might be a little hard from the pool. So I kind of slowed up. Right in them deserts, right up the hills like that. Right where the angels of the Lord appeared was heading right in that direction then, where they had appeared a few months before that. And as I went up the hill, the Spirit of God, when I turned around and looked on top of the mountain, He said, pick up that rock and say to him, Thus saith the Lord. You'll see the glory of God in the next few hours. I just picked up the rock and said, Brother Banks, I don't know why. I it up the air and I said, Thus saith the Lord. You're going to see the glory of God. He said, That meant Ruby. I said, no, I don't think it had anything to do with you, Banks, or Ruby, either one. I just think it was just saying, thus saith the Lord, something's going to happen. And the next morning when we were standing there, many of the men, I don't know how many sitting here now, there's 12 or 14, 15 of us sitting there. All of a sudden, a minister walked up to me and he said, Brother Branham, he said, uh, my name is so-and-so. He said, I was um, one of your sponsors in California. I said, I'm glad to meet you, sir. Douglas McHugh. He said, I'm, I said, I'm glad to meet you. Shook hands with him. He said, well, now, I want to ask you a question. He said, Roy Roberson, trustee here, Brother Woods, Terry, and Billy, and all, Brother McAnally, and I don't know who all were standing there. And I, he said, I want to ask you something. He said, does the Lord ever give you visions out like this? I said, yes, brother, but I come out here to kind of get away from it, to rest up. And I looked around like this, and I seen a heavy set doctor looking at him and said, Reverend McHugh, this allergy in your eye will soon put your eye out of Dr. G for two years, and I can do nothing about it. And I turned around to him. I said, what you asked me that for? Your doctor told you the other day that allergy was in your eye. It's middle of the day, about 11 o'clock. He's wearing sunglasses. And I said, the reason you're not wearing that because it's the sun is because of your eye. He told you you're going to lose that eye, and he started crying. So that's right. I turned to walk around again. I had a shovel in my hand. And I looked. And I see him standing there looking at me. His eyes just as bright. I said, but thus saith the Lord. You're not going to lose that, huh? I was hunting with him this last fall. He can see better than me than anybody in the crowd. You know? And I seen an elderly lady pull down her stock and raise up the side of her skirt. She said, son, if you see Brother Branham, tell him to pray for my feet. 
And I looked down there, and little, little, little tumors hanging on her feet all around. I said, your mother's a gray-headed lady, my son, you see. She told you before you left, if you see me, to have me to pray for her feet. She's got little tumors like hanging on her feet. He likes to faint it. I said, that's the truth. I said, tell her not to worry. It'll be all right. I started walking around, and I heard the voice of God speak. said, get out of the way quickly. Roy Roberts is standing there knowing he was a veteran of the war. I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Brother Roy, hide as quick as you can. So what's the matter? I said, get out of the way, hide. And I started walking around, put my shovel down, turned around, took off my hat, and here he come. Glory of God falling in a whirlwind that tore the side of the mountain out like that. It blasted and shook the place like that. Cut the top of the bushes out just about three or four or five feet above my head. Went back up like a funnel like that. It blasted again, and here it come three times. Then when it left the third time, Brother Banks came over and said, that's what you talked about. I said, yes. I said, what was it? I said, God appears in whirlwinds. I didn't know whether you want me to tell the people or not. Then I went on and prayed a little bit. Then he told me I could tell them. I said, it's judgment striking the West Coast. Look at her today. Look what happened a few hours after that. Alaska sunk and now the whole thing is going under. We're entering into the judgment. First she's been spared. But thanks be to God, we got hidden food, spiritual food, that we're living on the goodness and mercy of the revelation of Jesus Christ in these last days, vindicating himself among his people. Hey, man, they went in. Elijah went in before the drought set in. Thank God for being in before the judgment sets in. Now it's a time of coming out and going in. <laughs> Getting out of those organizations, getting into Christ, are coming out and going in time for all true believers. Right. Yes. So, but as far as the people were concerned, so they saw him as a prophet, like the woman at the well. She said, right. "You know, yeah, thou yeah. art a prophet." So they saw him as a prophet, which was nice, but not enough. Right. Some saw him as a gifted man, and that was nice, but that wasn't enough. See, they didn't see him in the scripture. Right. Right. So that group was a big group of people. Then there were other many denominational people, and they were in a state of, uh, they were in a very difficult place in that they knew the presence of the angel of the Lord. They knew it because you could sense it, you could feel it, you yeah. couldn't get away from it. And he would speak and reveal the secrets of the hearts to the people who came up and would always say, is that true, is that true? So they were having difficulty, you know, identifying that as just a gift and they knew that it was, uh, you know, unusual, it was something more, but they couldn't really identify it. Right. And so there were many, but that's where they began to really turn from him and at the end he says, you know, they're I moved here to Tucson, and uh, there has been no open doors. Right, right. See? And tied that to Jesus standing outside yeah. the door. You get my tape on marriage and divorce, that up on top of the mountain at Tucson, here not long ago, I was up there praying about it, they dismissed the schools. So watch that pillar of fire circling the mountain, going in a funnel, back and forth, up Amen. and down. Amen. People around here knows it. They're inside. And it, when he told me the truth of this marriage and divorce, Questions. If there's one side going this way and one going that way, there's got to be a truth somewhere. Amen. And after those seven seals, he showed what was the truth of it. This is to my church only. The, not my church. The little flock that believes me and follows me. This is to them. The other day, knowing that when I tell you anything, it must come, thus saith the Lord. Then I had the scriptures as he revealed it to me. But Lord God, what can I say to that congregation? I'll have separations. Man will be steady on the porch and out in the yard and everywhere else. Shall I leave her? Women, shall I leave my husband? What shall I do? I said, Lord, what can I do? Something said to me, go up yonder in the mountain. I'll talk to you. And while I was up in the mountain, not knowing that down in Tucson, they were seeing it. But even the teachers called the children from my little girl and then from the schoolroom and said, look yonder in that mountain. 
There's a fiery looking amber cloud going up in the air and coming back down, going up in the air and coming back down. Miss Evans, are you here? Ronnie, are you here? I come on back down to the station, this young boy by the filling station, the Evans filling station there. And before I know what the boy was going to say, he tucked me on my feet. He said, Brother Branham, he was up in that mountain over yonder, wasn't he? That morning I got up after seeing this vision, obeyed the Lord. I took my little boy Joseph to school. He's listening to me now in Tucson. I took him to school, told me that I didn't know when I'd be back. And I took off up into Catalina, up into the, uh, the foothills. And I went up into the place where the angel of the Lord put the sword in my hand real early. And started climbing up the mountain. Well, instead of going up in the peaks this way, which is a lot of snakes, scorpions, you know how Arizona is. I turned to my right. Something said, turn to your right. I went way into the peaks. I went around. And I was going around those great, huge rocks, many times bigger than this tabernacle. Laying up in them tops there where seldom ever a person could get. Along about 11 o'clock, I was going into a little cove. Back where some, a little place turned in like this over a little deer trail. And I had my shirt off. My hat my hand because I was just lathering with sweat. And so I turned in there, and as I turned in that little cold, I felt the presence of the Lord. I jerked off my hat and looked around. Oh, he's here somewhere. I know he's here. Oh, what is it? I made a few more steps. I said, Lord, you're here somewhere. I looked laying on the path, and there laid that little squirrel. Had jumped at something and missed it, and it hit a bunch of choya, that's jumping cactus. It ran through his head, chest, stomach, and he was dead. That odd looking little squirrel, he had missed my mouth and hit that choya. And the voice of the Lord said, Your enemy is dead. I stood there, I trembled, I took the foot and that. Usually crows would have eaten it up. I killed a snake a couple of days later. Then laid on the road about a half hour. There's always eagles and crows flying through there. They'll pick it up right now. I killed a coral snake. That's the most dangerous snake we got. Laying right beside me. A few days after that, I started to come back to pick it up to show it. Crows had done got it. Ravens passing over. And that had been laying there ever since I'd seen the vision two days before. It's on Saturday and I went up there on Monday. So... There he was laying on there dead. I mashed his with my foot. I went back around, sat down again, sat there and cried a while and prayed, looking down over Tucson, miles below me. Turned back around and come back and still laid there. When I entered that cold, the Spirit of God come on me again. I went on around, went down the mountain, went in and told my wife, I said, Honey, I don't know how, but I'm going to get over this. Dr. Ravensworth, when he gave me the examination, he said, It's totally impossible for you to be well. You give me a shot of pentothal that was to last me for five minutes and I slept ten hours. So uh, that stuff ain't even aspirin just knocks me out. So they, you give me a shot, put that tube down the throat. When I come to and he told me next morning, he said, Reverend, I hate to tell you this, but said your stomach walls are even so hard they're dried up. I never seen it. You used the name of gastritis and I went and looked in the dictionary and it said something is withered away. It said you can't get over it. It said you'll always have it. And I would have been a discouraged boy if it hadn't been for the vision of the Lord. And the next day something said go back to the mountain. And that day instead of going one way, I was led to go another way. And I was standing there. And looking set in front of me. And there sat that seventh little white dove. Looking right at me. I rubbed my eyes. I said, surely it's a vision. Surely it is. I looked at that little dove. Where do you come from? This is pretty and white. Could have been a pigeon. Whatever it was away in that wilderness. God Almighty, who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, whose servant I am, his word laid here open before me. 
know that I tell the truth and lie not. There stepped the dove, sitting there looking at me. I walked around, I thought, surely it's a vision. I turned my head, looked back, and there he sat there, them little white wings, just as snowy as he could be, his little yellow feet and little yellow beak, sitting there looking at me, he's watching right straight westward. I walked around him like I wouldn't touch him for nothing. I walked on up the trail, looked back, and there he still sat watching me. Brother, as the son of Abraham, I consider not what the doctor told me. I'm going to be well anyhow. The third day I went back. I was climbing up high. Many of you know the vision about the Indian chief riding that little wall to the west. Something attracted me all to a big rock. About noontime to lay your hands against that and pray. God in heaven knows this is true. I laid my hands against the rock and looked up towards heaven and started praying. I heard a voice coming out of the top of the rock there. said, what are you leaning against over your heart? I raised back like this, my bare shoulders naked from the waist up, hot. I looked back and there was rope in the quartz, in the stone, white eagle. That's exactly what the vision said that the next message would come forth by. I was so excited, I run home, got a camera, and come back the next day and took the picture of it. It was still there. Wrote in the rock, white eagle. Dove leading eagle. Somehow, uh, I know, I'll tell you before it happens, the doctor's a good, do- good doctor, no doubt. Uh, I think he's a fine man. But I, I know I'm going to be over it. It's done. It's finished. And I'm going to be well. I was thinking as Ernie sang that song a few moments ago, On the Wings of a Dove. How is the melody to that? Sorry for me, Ernie. See, there was no church in Tucson when I came here. Right. Uh, Brother Branham had asked some other brothers to start them, but uh, they would not because they wanted Brother Branham to say, this is to do this, do this. But when Brother Branham came to this city, uh, per the directions of the Lord, uh, he met with the ten full gospel pastors in this city. Assemblies of God, oneness, he had, a, he had a breakfast with them or a meeting or somewhere. I wasn't here. And they were concerned about him coming to the city because if he came here and started one, they knew that he would empty their churches. Because Brother Branham couldn't even go to church with his family. Because if he went, there would be two or three hundred people 
who were here in the city for Brother Branham to pray for him. And if they were to find out he was going to go to a Methodist church, they'd go there 5 o'clock in the morning and be waiting when the deacons got there to unlock the door, and they'd just go and fill up the church, and they would interrupt their program. So Brother Branham, if he went to church, he had to slip off. He had to secretly take his family and go somewhere to church. Brother Branham was a pleasure to preach to because he knew how to say amen. And you're sitting there, and I felt like Paul preaching to Jesus. Or you know, it, it just, you, wouldn't, you don't know what to do, but you, I was doing it because he told me to. Uh, he told Sister Branham whenever I came back from breakfast with him one time that Brother Green's coming to town and he's going to start us a church. He's the kind of guy that will get the job done. And the secret was is that I found the building without Brother Brown telling me. Now, he said that the other brothers, the reason they wouldn't start one is because they would find a building and they'd come and say, Brother Brown, is this where we're supposed to be? Well, he had told the pastors in this city he wouldn't start a church. That's the reason on the tapes from Shreveport, he says, I didn't start the church in Tucson. Brother Green did. Brother, Brother Branham had to do that to keep his word to the pastors in his city. But you see, if you want to be negative about it, you can say, well, Brother Green said that, Brother Branham said that wasn't his church. He didn't start that church. It's just according to your mental attitude about it. Yeah. But I took it because Brother Branham told me I followed the leadership of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you this, any time you do what the Spirit of God tells you to do, there's going to be opposition to it. And they're not going to be everybody, everybody's not going to agree with you. So that, that, that was the start of Tucson Tabernacle. But that Sunday, when Brother Brown talked about it, he said, we'll be in this building, and when I grow up, we'll go to another one, we'll move to another one, and then maybe, maybe by that time, the Lord will come. You, you've got to assemble ourselves together to worship God. The Bible said so. When we see this day approaching, that much more come together. If there's only two people here, you be one of them. Now that, and if we come together and worship together, then we just, something or other about it. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Now, as I've said before, Brother Green told me, and he said it, my wife come told me what he said when I was away, that, uh, he said this morning the pulpit was open at any time. Now, I usually, that's open for me to speak. Now, usually, I had to drive all the way to Jeffersonville, Indiana, to give a message that God gave me. Amen. To bring it to the people, go all the way to Jeffersonville, Indiana, and each one of you stringing across the country and hooking up the wires and things to get the message because that's what we're living on. That's what we're here for. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. God gives me a message, I can walk right here to the pulpit and preach it and feel free to do it. And I believe by that, that God Almighty will bless you if you will just stand by this church, this group of people. Not only that, but let's go out and see if we can't get others to come in. See, Let's speak to others everywhere. Speak to them about our church and what it means. But our church, we're here. We want you to come. Bring in strangers. And I'm sure it'll be good for all of us. See, we have a building which we're thankful for. We're thankful for this place together together. But high be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. See? For heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And where is the place of my rest? But a body has thou prepared me. And we are a body of Christ. So as we move from one building to another building, I believe, and we're bringing our messages, and we'll come down and have healing services, and anything the Lord reveals to us to do, we'll have it right here in the church until it swells out so big we have to take it somewhere else and somewhere else until Jesus comes. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Right. Dear God, as we stand here on this platform, which represents right over the altar here, we realize that we are a dying race of people as far as this earth is concerned. 
We look out upon the streets and see sin wrote everywhere. And that the glory of the Lord is swiftly departing. We know when the glory of the Lord goes up, so will the church go with it. God, we want to be there. Just a few days ago, standing here on the street corner, just across the street, watching that parade go down the street, seeing those old First War tanks leading the way, then come the big heavy Sherman tank. Behind that followed on and on and on. Then the gold star mothers, the little broke up family with a crying wife and a little ragged boy had lost his daddy. No mother had lost a son. Oh, how sad to stand on a street corner and watch something like that pass. And then noticing just as they passed this building, the music changed to onward Christian soldiers, playing their marches behind, but when they passed this spot, dear God, I'm thinking of another great time coming, and that would be the resurrection, when the old timers will come forth first, saints and patriarchs. For we which are alive and remain shall not prevent or hinder those which are asleep. For the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then when we see that great, this is people going marching up to the skies. And we be standing waiting for our change, knowing that we'll fall in line also. God, make us faithful soldiers. Only those who have really associated and been in the war to know what that really meant to see those tanks rolling by. God, we think that those who've been in the battle of life will know what it means when we're waiting our turn to fall in position and place in the resurrection to go up. Now, my text for this morning is an odd word, shalom. Shalom in the Hebrew means peace. And that's what I say to the church this morning, shalom. That's peace. In Finnish it's called Yumalan Raha, which means God's peace upon you. Raha, God. See? God's peace. Shalom. A New Year's message is to the church elected in Jesus Christ for 1964. Not, uh, not just the church groups, but the elect, the lady, uh, the lady of, of the church, Christ's bride. See, that's who I'm addressing. We're facing here in our two subjects that we read, the two scriptures rather, a very uh, contrast one to the other. In Isaiah it says, Rise and shine, for the glory of God has come upon you. The light is here. And then the very next verse he says, Gross darkness is upon this people. And then when we are in a mixture of light and darkness, and then my uh, address to the church is shalom, peace. Let's find out what it's all about. See? We are facing this year with both darkness and light. We are, the world is in one of the most chaotic times of darkness that it's ever stood in. And yet it's standing in again the most blessed light that it ever shined in. 